what I'm hoping to be able to do in our brief time together is talk a little bit about <coughs> how the nurses in the hematology site uh, contribute to your care, um, as well as then move on to the topic of brain fog or cancer-related brain fog, talk about that concept and discuss it as a phenomenon, see what's going on with that, and then provide some tips to help along the lines of the brain fog um, experience. So first of all, if I could just go through a little bit of how the nurses in the hematology site contribute to your care, um, I've broken it up into categories. And the reason I've broken it up into categories is because I have non-cancer related brain fog and I do better when I group things into little categories. And I'll explain why that happens a little later on. Um, so having said that, um, all of these different types of categories, you may see these nurses for various um, instances other than what is written up here and you may see these nurses or talk to the nurses um, along your whole cancer trajectory uh, they're not exclusive to each particular timing is all I want to say so from the new, per new person point of view because again the audience is certainly widespread some of you are new some of you um, have had treatment some of you have not had treatment some of you um, have moved on um, so I'm just going to group it that way as far as the new patients are concerned um, the nurses introduce you to the site of nursing because it's not just a nurse that you're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, on a week-to-week, month-to-month, and year-to-year -year basis. It's different nurses within the whole site. Um, during the course of a new patient experience, they're going to talk to you about the education around um, tests, processes, things that have to happen next, the next sort of steps that go on um, before we move into areas like treatment or discussion around treatment. They're also there providing support because people come um, with high anxieties and emotions around a new diagnosis, around the unknown, around what's going to happen next, and the nurses will talk to you about those kinds of things. And the other thing that's really big uh, throughout your entire um, journey, we'll say, is the coordination of care with the team. The hematology team is huge. Um, it's not just the people you see every day. It's not just the physicians, the nurses. Um, you also have supportive care people, you have um, the laboratory, you have the inpatient areas, the, we have transfusion medicine clinic, uh, we have even including pathology labs. So all of these kinds of things are all part of your team that have to coordinate in order to move things forward. So following uh, from new patients, moving on into before or during treatment, um, at the time that you're having treatment or just before you're having treatment, you may have discussions around different kinds of symptoms that you're experiencing, um, around side effects related to the treatment that's going on, and those are things that while you're actively on treatment, discussion around side effects is a big thing that happens with the nurses. Um, the other thing that happens throughout the entire course that they're available at all times, um, Monday to Friday, 9 to 4, is the telephone support. So you can call the telephone line. They are a team that are trying to meet your needs as best they can through phone support and through clinic support, um, which of course leads to the provide the supporting clinic. So you'll be seeing nurses throughout your journey in the clinic as well as on the phone. Once you've completed your treatment, you still have visits that you come back to. Um, and during the course of those visits, the nurses there will be talking about symptom screening. Um, symptom screening is something that is done at kiosks um, within the center and it's done with every visit and it's your opportunity to tell us what's, um, what's your most important thing that's going on in the day with relation to your symptoms. Um, and so the nurses will talk to you about those symptom screens that you all do or don't do. Um, they're the purple papers or the things that you can do online on a kiosk or at home. They will continue to connect you to resources. Again, as I said, there are resources in the community, there are resources within the cancer center, there are resources beyond. And again, based on your need and your questions and your dialogue with the nurse, they can connect you to these various resources. And finally, as I said before, that telephone support happens throughout your whole journey. The, the telephone su support does not stop. Um, in terms of um, other, there are two other areas that I wanted to sort of touch on from the nursing uh, point of view, and one of them is triage. Some of you may have experienced this and some of you may not because it's something that we're, we've been going on doing for a little period of time now. Um, currently, we've only been doing it in one clinic. We're actually expanding it. And so what triage is, 
is the ability it's to have a nurse at the front before everybody comes into their clinic visit to determine with specific questions your needs. So based on your needs, whether or not you would need to see a nurse on the course during the course of that visit. Um, and as a result of that, that kind of triage, that kind of um, short kind of communication with a nurse, what it does is it ensures that um, you, as a patient, get to the opportunity to talk to a nurse, because sometimes in clinic you don't always get the opportunity to talk to the nurse um, if you've wanted to or not wanted to. What this does is this allows you to tell us whether or not you need to speak to a nurse on that particular day. And there are some focused questions that the nurse will ask, um, and then there are some opportunities for you to tell us how you're doing, and we go from there. Um, the other area that um, is a little um, different is the transition care clinic. And the transition care clinic, um, it's not something that is for everybody. It is for, there are people that have um, had their diagnosis, have, have had their treatment, and their treatment has been over, um, and the cancer will say it's basically um, very, very, very unlikely to come back. And as a result of that, one can continue to be followed through their family doctor, provided the family doctor has clear instructions on what kinds of tests that should be done at what period of time. So within the hematology site, there are certain patients that um, meet those kinds of criteria that can move on to the transition care clinic where it's run by a nurse practitioner. Um, and within that clinic, the nurse practitioner talks about symptoms, talks about the whole experience that you've gone through, talks about mm -hmm. the, um, the plan of care, um, and then can move that forward towards a family doctor to continue with the provision that if you needed to come back within the cancer center that you would um, be expedited back into the cancer center. It's not something that is for everybody, but it is something that may be eligible for you. Um, and that would be something that you'd have to talk with your physician about. Um, so that's the transition care clinic. But I just wanted to give you the opportunity, or give me the opportunity to share a little bit about how we contribute to your care in general. So I'm going to move on a little to the topic at hand, which is cancer-related brain fog. Um, now, cancer-related brain fog is a very interesting um, topic, and I, I thought of this particular area to talk about because, again, as an audience, you're very widespread over where you are in your um, journey. So some of you are new, some of you are not new to the cancer, um, some of you are on treatment, some of you are not on treatment. But all of you may or may not have experienced a little bit of cancer-related brain fog. Um, now, common terms that are used are in the little bubbles. So people hear about things like chemo fog or chemo brain. Um, physicians would be more inclined to hear the thing called cancer-related cognitive dysfunction. I don't think that's something that's out in the, the community very well. Um, but essentially what it is is changes in thinking and cognitive abilities. So people experience changes in their thoughts and their thought processes and their ability to do things mentally. I actually want to share um, what's interesting is um, despite Dr. Google, one could go on the Lymphoma Canada <laughs> website, and I looked at um, a blog, which was interesting, because I looked up cancer-related um, cancer brain fog, and um, glasses have to now come off so I can read this, but let me share. The phenomena is commonly called brain fog or chemo brain, and a lot of cancer survivors go through it. Some doctors acknowledge it, some don't think it exists, which is ridiculous because when a 29-year-old woman with a university degree suddenly forgets how to mail an envelope, you got to admit that something's going on. The problem was that it is too multifactorial to understand what really causes it. The combination of crazy toxic medicines, fatigue, depression, stress, all these things on their own can cause cognitive impairment. So when all of these are rolled into one neat little cancer patient package, it just becomes a mess. And this was a blog that was written by Robin Harry, a patient, in 2012, in November. Um, the other one I, I looked at um, on the same website was, the term chemo brain is no joke, and I often felt overwhelmed at making simple decisions or following conversations. This was a blog by Alyssa Berkus Rolf in July of 2011. I just want to put it out there that it's being talked about, it's being shared amongst um, lymphoma survivors, it's being shared amongst patients, um, and it's also been researched, so there is evidence that's out there. 
So what exactly does brain fog mean? So let's sort of be clear on what we're talking about. It means that you may have some difficulty with maintaining focus or recalling details, maintaining attention or concentration. You may have trouble remembering things or doing many things at once, commonly called multitasking. Um, you might have trouble keeping your train of thought or finding words or word finding. These are things that are common kinds of every day, these are the things that I, I seem to be forgetting or having problems with. Now, it happens, the evidence shows that it's happening between 4 and 75 percent. So it doesn't happen to everybody. It, do, it can happen to many people. Um, and I'll continue. It can start during the actual diagnosis. Um, I would actually argue that brain fog can happen that's not cancer related as well, but I'll come back to that. Um, but it's most often noticed or picked up by patients during treatment. And again, when I've had conversations with patients and in my past um, hematology, it would come up. It would come up as a, I just can't focus. I, I just don't know why I can't seem to keep remembering things. I'm, I don't know what's going on. And I would say, oh, that sounds like chemo brain. And I've had um, physicians say, what's that? But in the meantime, cognitive related dysfunction they would understand. Um, so how long does this last? How long would brain fog last? Well, it's different depending on the person. There is no duration. There is no, sometimes it happens shortly. Sometimes it happens over the course of treatment. Sometimes it happens after treatment and goes away after treatment. Um, it certainly can improve once treatment is over, uh, but it could persist after treatment as well. Um, the only thing that I want to point out, and you probably could tell me better than I could tell you, it's very frustrating. So when people can't focus like they used to be able to focus or can't concentrate like they used to be able to concentrate, then that can be extremely frustrating to you. Now, of course, why does it happen? First of all, it's unclear. And like I said, there is links to um, treatment and re cancer-related brain fog. But there's no cause, there's no causal effect, no direct relationship. So it's really unclear why it happens. And the reason behind that is there's so many factors involved, so many potential um, reasons that can contribute to brain fog. And that includes things like the diagnosis of cancer in the first place, which can cause um, anxiety and emotional pressure. The treatment can cause it, fatigue can cause it, infection, if you're depressed. Then it's a part of a natural aging process. Our cognitive function slowly goes down a bit. If you're under stress, if you're having sleep problems, lack of nutrition, um, if you're on drugs for pain or other kinds of drugs, if you're on, if you have low blood counts, all of these things contribute to lack of clear thinking. And so one can't directly cause um, chemotherapy or treatment related directly to the brain fog. But there are things that you can do. Once again, I actually got this, um, got these, the, the, um, the groupings from um, a, a patient handout from UHN, from the uh, University Network, Health Network. Um, they have a, a handout for patients, which is available online. And what I liked about it the most is the way it grouped things. Remember I said at the very beginning I categorized so I can remember? So if you group things into groupings of three or five, they're better to remember. But things that you can do in terms of using memory aids, so using the use of timers, like timers in your kitchen clock or, or your kitchen stove, I should say, to help you um, keep on track, keep on time. The use of calendars, um, I realize that a lot of us are in the electronic age. A lot of us are still using old-time calendars, old-time lists. Um, many, many people make lists, whether it's a grocery list or a list of things to do. I had to make that list yesterday over yesterday and today, so I'd keep on track and keep on time. Um, so if you make those calendars and lists, they will help to remind you of things. Involve your family and friends. If you're coming for visits and you need to have somebody remember things for you, involve those people to remember. And again, the use of electronic devices, the use of GPSs to get you directions rather than you, you relying on memory for directions, that would be better. In terms of organizing your environment or organizing the day, one can use calendars or organizers to organize your day. Following the same routine, create and, and stay with the regular routine that you would normally have. It, it'll, um, you have to rely less on memory. Keeping all of your items in the same place. Isn't it frustrating to have to try to figure out where things are because you actually pick them up and put them down, not where you're used to having them. Did that with my keys this morning. Um, using a pill organizer. 
Again, it's another way to keep track of how you're managing your medication. You can also do things like sharpen your mental ability. So repeating things, repeating things over and over and over again. Um, they will help you to retain that in your memory. Filtering the information. I just talked to this earlier um, about filtering information. I've, I've, I tell nurses that um, I have holes in my brain. I can't keep everything in anymore. It's come to capacity, so things have to go. So th some things I'll remember and some things I don't. Please filter the information. Keep what you need to keep, but get rid of anything out, extra or else. Group things into categories. I've already uh, promoted that. Keeping a journal or writing down at the end of the day what your activities were through the day may help you to, um, again, strengthen the ability of memory. Um, practice using puzzles, using um, crossword puzzles, using um, brain teasers. Um, I'm trying to think about uh, the velocity. No, that. Oh my goodness, Sudoku, luminosity. That's where I was going. Um, using, you know, things like that can help to actually sharpen and try to avoid multitasking. Do um, one task at a time. If you avoid the multitasking, you won't get confused. There are two more types of things that you can do to help. Um, reduce your mental fatigue. So if you can contribute by m reducing your own mental fatigue by doing some pleasing activities. Get outside, walk, use some meditation, practice yoga. Listen to music that's more about nature. Um, reduce your stress wherever possible. Eliminate things that cause stress. Walk away from things that cause stress. And stay with things that keep you focused. Reduce noise. Noise can also contribute to lack of thinking, we'll say. Stay motivated. Stay positive. Um, and the other thing that's, that I didn't put up there but is really, really important, humor. There's this whole big talk on humor is the best medicine. Keep, keep the humor in your head. Um, maintain a healthy lifestyle. I loved the quote, what is good for the heart is good for the brain. What's good for the brain will help with your mental fog. Um, so physical exercise, eating healthy foods, um, drinking plenty of water, getting enough sleep, and making sure that you can socialize. So in general, what I've actually tried to talk to you about is the fact that we brain fog exists. It does exist um, across the trajectory. Most likely it's with um, treatment. There are many factors that contribute to it. There are things that you can do about it. It does improve over time. And I want to leave with a story. It's a, a story of a colleague that um, a colleague had told me about, again, her interaction with patients. A common thing that patients had experienced was they couldn't even get through reading um, a page in a book. So the concentration or the mental thoughts around reading which is an enjoyable activity. Um, they would read the page, but have to read it over and over and over again because they couldn't remember what the sentence was. Over time, people would actually look at reading and getting to read the paragraph, then go beyond the paragraph to half a page. And when people, as time went on, could get past that page again, they were on the right track as far as their mental capabilities. So stay with it. Know that it does improve if you're experiencing it. There are things that you can try to do to help with it. Um, and I think that's all I want to share with you.